it's a Sri Ram's appearance day, so we are supposed to sing some mantras for Sri Ram. So those who don't know, they can see. We we will use two of them, first the second, the third one optionally. So okay, this maybe I, I need Bandam <laughs> Sahagana Dalta Shri Vishakantam Shyam Namah Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shmate Bhakti Vodanta Swamit Namine Namaste Sarasvata Deva Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishasa Shunyeva Dipashtya Dushatarine Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasati Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everybody. So we will start with singing of those two mantras for old Ramachandra. <laughs>
of Lord Ramachandra. We begin with some background to the whole story. It will take about 40 minutes to read it, so have patience, but I think you will be very pleased to listen to this story. Because the story is about spiritual life, it's about ecology, it's about human behavior, how to go, from animal existence to the godly existence. Simply, how to become a liberated human being. How to develop pure love of God.
This is a book about seven secrets of Vishnu. This book describes seven of appearances of Lord Buddha. So, as we know, Lord Krishna incarnates in different times to do some tasks. These incarnations are called Lila Avatarans, meaning avatar that should give the pleasure for the Lord and his devotees. Some of these avatars are displayed in the animal forms, some of them are displayed in the human forms. So now let us hear the story. Ram's secret outgrow the beast to discover the divine. Vishnu stories can be divided in two sets, those who function in timeless realm and those who function with time, within time. The first set deals mostly with Devas and Asuras. The second set deals with Manavas and Rakshasas. The battle of Devas and Asuras has more to do with timeless issues revolving around wealth creation, emotional security, and intellectual growth. The battle between Manavas and Rakshasas has more to do with appropriate social conduct ethics and morality that is a function of history and geography. Devas live in the sky and Asuras live under the earth. Their battle is aligned vertically between the celestial realms and the nether regions. Manavas and Rakshasas live on earth. Their battle is aligned horizontally between culture and nature, between dharma and adharma. Everything will be explained. All those terms like dharma and adharma will be explained in the course of reading. Words like justice, righteousness, and goodness do not adequately explain the term dharma because notions of justice, of what is right and good, change over time and are different in different parts of the world. Very important to understand this. Dharma is the underlying principle that enables man to realize his divine potential to social behavior. To understand the words Dharma and Adharma, we have to realize the stark divide between humans and the rest of nature. Only humans have the ability to reject the law of the jungle, both positively and negatively. Positive rejection of the law of the jungle means that we empathize and include others in our quest for security and growth. This is dharma. Negative rejection of the law of the jungle means that we exploit others and include all in our quest for security and growth. This is Adharma. Dharma manifests as rules that seek to provide for and protect all creatures. This means actions that help the helpless where the mighty care for the meek. Adharma is the very opposite, taking advantage of the law of the jungle for the benefit of the few at the cost of the rest. Adharma is about domination, territoriality, hoarding, attachment and power. Dharma is about outgrowing these cravings. Humans who uphold Dharma are called Manavas. After Manu, the first human who rejected the law of the fishes. Humans who uphold Adharma are called Rakshasas and are often described as demons. 
both Manavas and Rakshasas are grandchildren of Brahma, indicating that they are two different frames of mind. The conflict forms the keystone of the epic Ramayana. So the story of Rama is described in, in the Ramayana. Ramayana was written by Sage Valmiki, who is sup said to live about 60,000 years meditating, so long that only bones became left, the whole body was destroyed. But he was stark, very strong, determined to gain his, <coughs> his goal. And then when he got this goal, he self-realized himself, then he, done, he wrote down the Ramayan, the story of Prince or King Ra. The only incarnation of Vishnu, who was a king sitting on his throne. It will, it will come later. Ramayana tells the story of Ram, okay, the only avatar to be worshipped as king. It is the story of a man who upheld the code of civilization and refused to succumb to animal instincts despite every provocation. To appreciate the Ramayana, one must first hear the story of Prithu and his father Vena. So Maharaj Prithu and Maharaj Vena, his, his father, are very important persons in, in an epic, in a story called Bhagavata Purana. We will come to this later. The Bhagavata Purana refers to a king called Vena, who plundered the earth so much that the earth in this cast ran away in the form of a cow. This naturally resulted in chaos. The plants refused to bear fruit and seeds did not sprout. There was hunger everywhere. Animals cried, humans wailed. The sages then decided to do something about it. They picked up a blade of grass, chanted magical hymns, turned the grass into a potent missile, and used it to kill the greedy king. The rishis, it's a name for the Vedic sages, they are called rishis, meaning seeds, they can see into the past, present time, and into the future. The rishis then turned Venus' corpse, removed all that was savage and untamed in it and created a new king from the distilled, purified, positive elements. This king was called Prithu, a form of Vishnu. Prithu went to the earth cow and requested her to provide milk for his subjects, but the cow refused. She was still angry. So Prithu raised his bow and threatened to shoot her down with his arrow. If you kill me, said the earth cow, then all the nature will be destroyed and so will all life. Prithu then argued that without domesticating the earth, he could not feed humanity. At this time, it was time that one king was a sovereign all over the whole earth, not just one country. At the time, Prithu was, Maharaj Prithu was a lord over the whole earthly globe. He had no choice but to tame the earth, turn the forest into fields, route the water and rivers with canals. Do so then in moderation, said the earth cow. So Prithu promised to institute dharma to rules that allow culture to thrive without destroying nature. This shows how it should go. So if we see what happened now, we can make this, this comparison. This is not easy. It must be remembered. Because human life is validated when there is growth. Animals have no such desire to grow. 
growth of human civilization involves the domestication of nature, the uprooting of forests and destruction of ecosystems. This material growth can destroy the world if unchecked. The only way to check it is by tempering it with intellectual growth and emotional growth, which are the two limbs of spiritual growth. Dharma balances nature and culture between the needs of animals and the needs of humans. The symbol of Dharma is the bow which the gods gave to Prithu. The bow indicates balance. The string cannot be left loose or too taut. Prithu is described as the first responsible king of earth. This is why the earth is called Prithivi. Being subdued to the, to the Prithu. As human society creates settlements, forests are turned into fields and animals are domesticated. This gives man extra resources, more food and time. This enables man to move from material pursuits to other pursuits, such as art and philosophy, but to ensure that there is no excessive material exploitation of earth. Rules are put in place. These rules are known as Varna, Ashrama, Dharma. Varna Dharma means every human being has to function as per his station in life. While Ashrama Dharma means every human being has to function as per his stage in life. Thus, in Dharma, humanity is governed by duty, not desire. So, when we are governed by desire, then we are not fully human. Rules are not ends in themselves. They are warning signs so that greed does not rear its ugly head. There are four stations in society. Brahmana, the station involved with spiritual activities. Kshatriya, the station involved in administrative activities. Vaisha, the station involved in wealth-generating activities. And Shudra, the station involved in service-providing activities. Varna means disposition. Yati means profession. In an ideal world, Varna corresponds to Yati, being the same, practically. But this is rarely the case. Today, it's not the case at all. If it were so, then Varna would supersede Yati, as Varna is natural, while Yati is man-made. When Yati supersedes Varna, when professional station is given more importance than natural disposition, problems emerge. So we have this in India because artificially, in India there is this, this one is trying to obey this one ashrama system, but in fact it's turned to be ajati, what we know in, in modern world called caste system. So, Varna system, when not properly applied, became still Yati, and Yati will become a phenomenon what is called caste, mm -hmm. is, which is lying on the ground of your bed. If you're born in Brahmin family, then you're considered to be Brahmin. When you're born in Shudra family, you are considered to be Shudra, which is not true, because if you are born in a Brahmin family, but you are not in possession of Brahminical qualities, you are only Brahmin to the name, but you are not 
Brahmin to the substance. You are you are Shudra. If you behave as Shudra, then you are Shudra. So our behavior, behavior is the most important thing there. It shows to which of those stations of life you belong. Not what you tell people. What you do is important. Mm. Even Jesus Christ said this many times. There are four stages of ashramas of life. Brahmacharya, the student state. Grihasta, the householder state. The vanaprasta, the retirement state. And sannyasa, the hermit state. Ashrama and jurists that not more than two generations utilize the earth's resources at any one time. When the grandson is born, it is time to retire. Eat less food than the householder. And when the great grandson is born, it's time to become a hermit. Eat what the forest, not the field, provides. This was a classical system, of course. In the modern society, it looks a little bit differently. But the principle is the same. The role of instituting and maintaining dharma in society is given to the king, who is treated as the diminutive double of Vishnu. So, the king in that society was a representative of Vishnu, was worshipped as, as the same as Vishnu. Like Vishnu seated on the hood serpent, he has to stay alert and ensure everybody behaves as expected of their station and stage. If things go wrong, he has to rush as Vishnu would rush on his eagle to set things right. Like Vishnu, he has to blow the conch shell trumpet to remind people of their obligations to outgrow animal instincts. Like Vishnu, around whose index finger rotates the wheel, he has to revive things periodically to ensure things keep moving. Like Vishnu, he has to wield his mace and lotus, punish lawbreakers and revolt law abiders. So, what we read right now, it was explanation of those paraphernalis that we can observe on Lord Vishnu. Now we can know why those things he has in his four things, what they mean. Sometimes being long time Krishna consciousness, sometimes we don't know those things. Now it's become explain only this would ensure peace and prosperity in the kingdom and if all kings function as Vishnu does there will be peace and prosperity across the world the needs of humans will be satisfied without affecting the needs of animals and plants and the regenerative capacity of earth. Only if the king does his duty will the earth cow be happy. But in the material world, nothing is permanent. As faith in spiritual reality collapses, fear resurfaces, Duty gives way to desire. Ambition raises its ugly head and eventually rules are compromised. Humans refuse to function as per day station in society and stage of life. Everybody does as he likes. Especially in Sweden you have this beautiful putri. Beautiful saying. Expression. You know what it is? How you say? <coughs> Which one are you thinking about? <coughs> about uh, materialism as a 
Yes. If I feel, I will do it. Have you said this in Swedish? If I feel for this, I will do it. How you, how you say this in Swedish? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. But there's a short version of this also. How you say this? Usually every day you say this so many times. Okay. Okay, but but that's the point. If I send her, if I send her for this, so you're you're there. Meaning, you are in the focus. You are the most important. What you feel is the most important. The others, what they feel is not that important. You do it, bora on the center for them. Ingen empati. No. Okay. Ingen är viktig. The excesses of man breaks the back of the head cow and makes her other soul. In despair, she turns to her guardian, Vishnu, and he responds by descending in various forms. Sometimes animal, sometimes human. Those descents are known as avataranas, and the form Vishnu takes each time is known as avatar. The number of altars varies. The most popular list based on Jayadeva's 20th century song, Gita Govinda, has 10. Matsya, Kurma, Varaha, Narasimha, Vaman, Rasuram, Ram, Krishna, Buddha, and Kalki. In the Bhagavad Purana, there are 22 avatars. The others 12 are Chatursana, Narada, Nara, Narayan, Kapila, Dattatreya, Yagna, Vishabha, Pritu, Danvantari, Mohini, Vyasa, and Balaram. Others included in the list of avatars are Hansa and Hayagriva. Vishnu's rescue is material, destruction of forces that threaten the nature and social order. The rescue is also spiritual, enlightening creatures for they, they do not threaten natural and social order. It has often been commented that the order of Vishnu's descent follows the evolution of man the aquatic matsya, fish, then amphibian kurma, mm, turtle, then the terrestrial varaha, boar, followed by half human, narasimha, half man, half, half lion, and finally the human vaman. The human avatars in turn follow the varna system, Parashurama is Brahmana who behaves as Kshatriya. Ram is a Kshatriya by birth and action. As a pure Kshatriya in the purest form. Krishna is Kshatriya by birth, but functions as Vaisha, covert, and Shudra, <coughs> Charayotar. They also follow the Ashrama system. Parashurama is Brahmachari, Ram and Krishna are Grihastis. Buddha becomes a Vanaprasti and finally Sanyasi. While material reality is bound to transform, Vishnu makes the transformations predictable by anticipating the changes and acting accordingly. Thus, over time, all organizations and systems and processes and codes lose their relevance. This inevitable and gradual collapse of all systems is expressed in the concept of yoga. Just as a human life has four phases, childhood, youth, maturity, and old age, every organization or system goes through four phases, Krita, Treta, Dvapara, and Kali. It is said that the bull of Dharma stands on four legs in the Krita Yuga, on three legs in Treta Yuga, two in Dvapara Yuga, and one in Kali Yuga. After this, the bull of Dharma and the society 
it upholds is washed away by the waters of pralaya, meaning waters of dissolution, of destruction. Pralaya means destruction. There are partly pralayas that occurs between some years of Krata Brahma and complete pralaya when Brahma after living hundred years dies. It's called sometimes Mahapralaya, the great dissolution, the great this is death of the world followed by rebuilt in the new life the four yugas will follow each other once again this is the Kala Chakra of the cycle of time in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says whenever Dharma is threatened I descend to set things right this line has to be read with an understanding of yoga. Vishnu does not stop the march of time, nor does he reverse it. An avatar does not restore the ideal dharma, because there is no ideal dharma. An avatar redefines dharma for a particular age. Dharma of Krita Yoga is not the dharma of Treta Yoga. Times are different. Needs are different. Hence the code of civilization is different. This is very important for us as Krishna's devotees to understand. Because sometimes when we read the scripture, I read it every day on the internet. Some devotees ask it, but it's written in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam that he has done like this and then that. We, we, those people who who write those, those things. They don't understand this process that every time has its own, own rights and its own life. And, uh, and therefore, we cannot compare certain things because they are going in the certain circles that are closed, and particularly for this age. Not the other. One can look at Vishnu as a doctor who appears whenever there is a disease. He restores health but does not stop aging. Eventually, a patient will die. The doctor's duty is to help the patient live a full and healthy life. This is what avatars do. Balance human demands with nature's needs for as long as possible. Pralaya is an eventuality, but an avatar prevents it from happening prematurely. Important thing to understand also. One can say that when one age has reached its ebb, an avatar appears to facilitate a transition to the next age. Parashurama, thus, appears when the golden age of Krita Yoga gives way to the silver age of Treta Yoga. Ram appears when the Treta Yoga gives way to bronze age of Dvapara Yoga. Krishna appears when the Dvapara Yoga gives way to the iron age of Kali Yoga. Buddha shows the way in the Kali Yoga and when Kali Yoga comes to a close, Kalki heralds pralaya, death that leads to rebirth. The shift from Krita Yoga into Treta Yoga happens when the notion of property emerges. Property relates to several things, domesticated animals, land, and even women. The wife is visualized as property. She is expected to be obedient and faithful to her husband. In the Krita Yoga, this is voluntary. But as Golden Age draws to a close, desire and passion changes all this. Fidelity is enforced. Also, no anymore natural fidelity. You need the rules and regulation to be to be kept in, 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 in inside some decent behavior.
this is uh, this happens percentually. So seventy five percent in Theta Yuga you are okay. Fifty percent in Vapara you are okay. Twenty five percent in Kali Yuga you are okay. And supposedly you were hundred percent okay in in Krita Yoga. Called also Satya, Age of Light. Renuka, a princess, marries Jamad Agni, a priest, and she bears him five sons, the youngest of whom is Parashuram. Renuka is a faithful wife, so faithful that she can collect water in unbaked pots made of clay from the riverbank. But one day, Renuka sees a handsome Gandharva, Gandharva the, Gandharvas the celestial beings, very beautiful, sings beautiful, looks beautiful. And sporting with his wives. Some say it's not a Gandharva, but a king called Karta Virya. She is smitten with passion for the handsome man. This momentary, adulterous doubt causes her to lose her magical powers. She can no longer collect water in unbaked clay pots. When her husband realizes this, he is furious. He orders his sons to behead their mother, cut her head off. The elder four refuse and so die instantly. Parashurama, however, picks up the axe and severs his mother's neck. Please, with this unconditional obedience, Jamat Agni offers Parashurama a boon. Resurrect my mother back to life, says Parashurama. Jamat Agni does so for he is a priest of the Brigu clan. And like Brigu and Brigu's son Shukra, who served the Asuras, he possesses Sanjeeva Nividya, the sacred lore of bringing the dead back to life. So, from this we know that Jesus Christ wasn't the first to bring the dead to life. Many times, long time before him, there were others. Very interesting. From where this idea could come to the biblical world. Because this is like many ages before, before the Jesus Christ age, which was like 2000 years ago. Here we are talking about like million years about if we take to some, some Vedic calculations. Like sixty billion years ago or something like that. In Krita Yoga, cows are distributed freely by kings. The act of Kshatriya generosity and Juris Brahmanas can carry out their rituals and other spiritual and philosophical obligations without worrying about income. But then Krita Yuga draws to a close and Kartarvidya, king of the Harihaya clan, seeks the return of a cow gifted to Jamad Agni. Jamad Agni finds the very idea preposterous. No one takes back gifts once given. This is what the civilization. If you gave once, you cannot take it back. If you do this, this is a demonic behavior. But the king insists and begins to take the cow by force. Kartarvirya is powerful king, blessed with a thousand arms, a metaphor for his military might. Interesting statement. Because when we read the scripture, 
Bhagavatam. There are descriptions of many entities. They, they have thousands, ten thousand hands, arms, or heads. And then we stand in that position. How to take it? Shall we understand this literally? Was the time where there was a person who had uh, 10,000 arms? Or should we understand this metaphorical uh, 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 as a metaphor? It's up to you to decide. But it's worth to think about. Because if you take those descriptions metaphorically, then many things will come into its right place. If you take it literally, then you are in some, some trouble. Because whatever you experience just goes against this. So... If you read such a passage in, in scripture, think about those things. Depends how you want to see your world. Kartavirya is a powerful king, blessed with a thousand arms, a metaphor for his military might, and no one can stop him. Jamadagni begs the king to stop, but the king refuses. Parashurama cannot bear to see his father demean himself so. So important, honor, the feeling of honor, so important. Today, you are spotting people in the face, they are saying that it's raining. At those times, it was a little bit different. You couldn't do that. It's also a way of Vedic culture. He cannot bear to hear the piteous cries of the cow being dragged away by the king. So he picks up his axe and hacks the king to death. This is a shocking event. The killing of a king by a prize. When the sons, and we should remember that this king was not only, only pure kshatriya, only pure uh, uh, military man. He was king priest at the same time also. Therefore, this act is very important. And gives some turning point in, 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 in our history. This is a shocking event, the killing of a king by a priest. When the sons of Kartaviria hear of this, they avenge their father's death by raiding Jamat Agni's hermitage and cutting his head off. An infuriated Parashurama takes an oath to rid the earth of all warriors and kings. So a massacre begins. He kissed 21 generations. Some say 21 clans. Again, very interesting. Mm -hmm. If we accept seeing this, I, I, I killing 21 generations, that means Thousand and thousand years of killing. But if we take understanding that it's about 25 or 21 clans, then for our modern mind, it will make more sense. Because this is possible. This is within the scope of what we can do. We can accept this more willingly than this description of killing going on under 25 generation. One generation is 25 years, so it's 620, 620 
five years. And of course, we are talking about years of God, so there are like billions of years. It's worth to uh, meditate about this. So much blood flows that it forms five lakes. Parashurama uses the blood of fallen kings to make funeral offerings to his father. He then swears to keep a watchful eye over the kings of the earth who abuse their military might to gain power. But then, one day, Parashurama encounters Ram. He realizes his work is done, for Ram is the modern king. One who never uses his royal power for personal gain. Ram, like Parashuram, is an avatar of Vishnu, but the only one to be visualized and worshipped as a king. We know Krishna at at it, his most, he was considered the, the prince and never worshipped as a king. Parashurama, though born in a family of priests, behaves as warrior, thus transgressing the rules of Varna. Ram, however, is born in a family of kings and all his life behaves in keeping with what is expected of royalty. He is the eldest son of Dasharatta, king of Ayodhya, born of the first wife and rightful heir to the throne. But on the eve of his coronation, his stepmother, Haikei, reminds Dasharatta of a promise made long ago that he would give satisfy any two of her wishes. She demands that Ram go into exile and live as a hermit in the forest for 14 years, and her son, Bharata, be made king instead. When informed of the situation, Ram, without regret or resentment, abandons his royal robes and goes to the forest, followed by his dutiful wife Sita and his loving brother Lakshman. To Kaikei's despair, Bharata refuses to take the throne acquired through the saint. He decides to live like a hermit himself and wait for his brother to return and reclaim his right to the throne. The behavior of the Ram's brothers are very unlike the behavior of other brothers. Ram encounters as he moves from north to south during his exile. Far to the south is the kingdom of Lanka, ruled by Ravana, the Rakshasa who has usurped the throne from his brother Kubera. The Kubera, he was like a, considered a being god of wealth. So all wealth is, his, is in his disposition. So Ravana, by gaining a military power, so removed him from the position. The Yaksha, Kubera is a Yaksha, as a, you could say, a good entity, but a Rakshasa is a demon like. In between Ayodhya and Lanka is Kishkinda, land of monkeys, ruled by Vali, who was supposed to share his kingdom with his brother Sugriva, but following a misunderstanding kicks him out. This is not a geographical reference, rather a metaphorical indicator. In mythic vocabulary, north, the realm of steel, pole star, is indicative of spiritual reality. And south, the opposite, is indicative of material reality. We know from reading our Shastra, and uh, even for, especially from reading uh, 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 Rig Veda, 
that Aryans living in the north was fighting with Dravidians living in the south. The Aryas were noble and white and the Dravidians were of dark complexion and no civilization at all. So, this you can find in Rig Veda. So, this, this understanding presented here is, is correct. It's another word, but meaning is the same. So, Aryas are spiritual and Dravidians are citizens of the, of the south. They are demons, considered demons, and lacking of civilization. Material persons. This is still going on. And so, the farther one goes from Ayodhya to the south, the Ramayana reveals a gradual decay in the principles of Dharma and the rise of man's animal and demoniac nature. When Ram is, is progressing towards the Lanka, so he meets all the time different creatures, different kind of demons. He fights them with his, with his brother and, and uh, restore at Harma there. But they are there. They, they are more to the south, to the condensation of such a creature and uh, such an uncivilized behavior. In the forest civilization, in the forest, civilization is gradually abandoned and the rules are forgotten. Through force, a man can take his brother's property. Through force, men and women can disregard the marital rights of others. Neither Sita nor Ram let the forest erode their values. Wherever they go, they hold on to the principles of Dharma. They may have left Ayodhya, but Ayodhya never leaves them. So the forest is a metaphor for the, 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 the chaos, unorganized reality, where the cosmos is this reality that is ruled by, by, by the laws. So the forest is always indication. <laughs> You never know what will going to happen there, you no? Know? Who is hiding behind the tree and things like that? So, no rules, no rules and regulations. There. Everything can happen by chance. In the forest, Ram encounters a monkey called Sugriva, and helps him become king. In exchange, Sugriva, in exchange, very important. Sugriva offers to help Ram find Sita. Sugriva is bound by his word to help Ram. No such obligation binds another monkey called Hanuman. Hanuman serves Ram anyway. This is the difference. Both of them are, are, are good. But Sugriva does this thing as a business-like thing. But Hanuman is loving Ram. This is the difference. So, Hanuman is on a spiritual platform. Sugriva is good. In the mood of goodness. In sattva. But he has some interest in what he is doing. He is materially conditioned. So, sometimes in our life we meet good people, but we have to explore what their motives are. And then, if we are enlightened ourselves, then we can judge properly who they are and what they want from us. Do they love us? Or do they want to exploit us? 
So, intentions are very, very important. This spirit of generosity indicates spiritual awareness, a concert beyond the self for the other. Hanuman just breaks free from Prakriti and becomes Purusha. Prakriti means symbolize his here material existence and Purusha symbolize the spiritual existence. Animals are governed by their sexual and violent instincts. Hanuma, humans can overpower those instincts, instincts because of their larger brain. To animal, without the benefit of larger brain, Hanuman practices celibacy and fights only for the benefit of others. This transforms him into an object of veneration. Dog beast, he comes to be equated with God. All over the India, everybody worships Hanuman as an example of perfect servant. We worship him as a God, expansion of God. An example of unconditional love and service to the Lord. Practically, it's maybe in this temple, maybe on this wall, you can see Ram alone, but usually he is portrayed with his wife Sita, his brother Lakshman, and with Hanuman kneeling with the throne or something. Always. Ram is always there. Under the leadership of Hanuman, the monkeys built a bridge across the sea to the island kingdom of Lanka and launched an attack on Ravana's citadel. A king is supposed to be provider and protector of his people. Ravan is neither. He is the archetypal alpha male, for whom kingdom is nothing but a territory. He is unwilling to give up Sita even if it means the destruction of Lanka. He sends his brothers and sons to their deaths, but refuses to part with Sita. He wants this way at all costs. Gives example of demoniac behavior. No taking consideration in it. Only my will is the only yeah. right thing to do. Ravana has ten heads and twenty hands. He is described as the son of priest, well versed in the scriptures. He is also described as a devotee of Shiva. Despite of all this knowledge and all the powers bestowed upon him, he does not display wisdom. While the monkeys have transformed themselves into humans, Ravana descends from being human to animal. In fact, he is worse than animal, for his actions are not motivated by self-preservation or self-propagation as animals do. He is consumed but self-delusion and self-importance and that is ultimately his downfall. So, we can draw a lecture, lesson from, from that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we do as Ravan did, so, we will go to the same end as his. Maybe not literally the same, but in consequence, we will land in that position, sooner or later, in the absolute consideration, the time does not play no role, not even exists. After killing Ravana, 
Ram returns to Ayodhya with his wife Sita, with his wife Sita, and is crowned king. This marks the dawn of Ram Rajya, the rule of Ram, considered the golden age when Dharma is perfectly upheld. So now we came across the the same golden age. In the beginning of our reading. We, we heard that Krita Yuga or Satya Yuga was the golden age, but Ram is acting in the, in, in the Treta Yuga, in the silver age. But now it's described that his rule was a golden age. That means that in, in specific periods of time called Yugas, there are ups and downs. So this downfall in civilization, so devolution you could call it, does not appear like this with the white line. But it's, it's ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. But steadily it's going down. Similarly, according to our philosophy, we are now at the beginning of the golden age in Kali Yuga. Now under the 10,000 years, the teachings of Lord Chaitanya will give light of enlightenment to, to all human beings. For 10,000 years at least, everything will be improving, but after some time it will rapidly go down again, in the same manner as I described before. But then one day Ram hears street gossip. The people of Ayodhya are embarrassed to have Sita as their queen for having spent several months at Ravana's captive, she is a woman of tainted reputation. So, this is Vedic civilization. A wife is above the all suspicion, as in the, this famous saying of, of, from, from Roman history. The wife of the Caesar is above of all suspicion, and we know what she did. <laughs> she was more than, than suspected. She did the things, but because she was a wife of the Caesar, so despite this, she was above all suspicion. But in the Ram's time, in the Vedic civilization, this is the rule. The wife. cannot be even suspected of doing anything unlawful. If this happens, then we have the situation that we are going to, to listen about. Ram promptly abandons Sita and has her sent to the forest. This despite the fact that she proves her fidelity by walking through fire unscathed. This is the controversial conclusion of the Ramayana. The obvious injustice is clearly at odds with the principles of the Dharma. This episode draws attention to the complexity of the Dharma. Is Ram the king of Ayodhya first or the husband of Sita? As king, he is obliged to respect the wishes of the people of Ayodhya and the rules of his dynasty that a woman of tainted reputation cannot be queen. But as husband, he is obliged to protect his wife. Ram chooses to be king first, sacrificing personal joy so that the integrity of the ruling family is never compromised. One can argue that as king he should protect Sita 
who is besides being wife and queen, also his subject. The complicated situation. Multi faceted. But one must remember that as king, Ram is expected not to make rules, but to uphold them. This rule is the rule of his clan and he is obligated to uphold it. And Ram submits to it. This tale just draws attention to the limitation of rules and traditions. Very important. Sometimes people tend to get so involved with rules and regulations and traditions that they forget about the real issue. So this story, reflecting about this, meditating about this, can give us uh, enlightenment about the things not always are as they look. The rules and traditions of the Raghu clan, which made Ram obey his father at the start of the epic, turn out to be draconian at the end of the epic, when innocent Sita is rejected on grounds of tainted reputation. But why Ram abandons Sita, the queen? He does not abandon Sita, the wife. He refuses to remarry. Also, this is an important point, because king has to give also next king in, 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 into the creation. He has to have an heir. And at this moment, they had no children. So, rejecting her, he should remarry. To, to be able to give his subject a next king. But, he does not do that. Instead, he places beside him on his throne the golden effigy of Sita, a reminder that none can take her place. That the metal used to make Sita's image is gold, the purest of metals, is symbolic representation of what Ram thinks of her character. He knows perfectly well she's innocent. But he has to submit to the, the, the demand of, of, of the citizens. At that time, kings were like that. Today, no politician would, would do this, because they all interested it in the center. Every act in Hindu mythology has a consequence. The author chose to call those events described in, in Holy Scriptures as mythology. So, one can discuss what the world of mythology means. Mythology builds on the myth. Myth is, is a situation when there is some real happening and at the base of the story. But it cannot be traced if it's real or apparent. Therefore, it's called mythical, half-truth. So, usually in philosophy, we, on history or in history of religions, we, we call those of distant prehistoric happenings as mythological events. Not always understanding what the meaning of the word is, bringing down to our level those, those things that happen then. After Sita is abandoned, Ram loses the only battle of his life. His royal horse is captured 
by love and course. Sita's children. Born in the forest, who don't know that Ram is their father. They successfully fend off Ram's army and indicator the Dharma rests with Sita, not with Ayodhya. Sita stops the war between Ram and his sons. Her victory is clear proof of her purity and chastity. The people of Ayodhya beg her forgiveness and ask her to return to the palace after reaffirming her chastity once more. So they once they, they beg for forgiveness, but despite this, they want her to go through the same procedure once again. So Sita asked the earth to open up and swallow her if she has been a faithful wife. The earth immediately opens up and Sita descends to the natural regions. It is, in effect, the return of Lakshmi to the land of her fathers. Lakshmi is the goddess of, of love, of riches, of wisdom, depending on the situation. The wife of Naraya, the wife of God. Ram as Vishnu refuses to stay on earth without Lakshmi, and so, after begetting his kingdom to his son, walks into the river Sarayu and gives up his mortal body. The final chapter of the Ramayana draws attention to the difference between Dharma and Niti and Riti. Niti means law and riti means tradition. Laws and traditions are created in full earnestness, <coughs> earnestness to help the helpless. Sometimes they can end up being unfair and cruel. Sita's abandonment is a case in point. When law and tradition fail to uphold the principle of dharma, they need to be abandoned or changed. This talk is elaborated in the story of Krishna. So, if you would read next chapter, then author gives a logical way to how Krishna did this. So, this was the story of Sitaram and on Wednesday, yes, Wednesday, Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. 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 yes, that is one day. I have the Indian calendar, yeah. So on Tuesday, it's the Ram Navami, appearance of Lord Ram. But because of that every one of us is working, so we are celebrating this today. So I have chosen to read this because I found it very interesting and very enlightening to, to see at the story which I, I can read in our scriptures where the descriptions are full of, of uh, uh, so-called mythological meanings. And, and when reading this without a, a proper guidance of spiritual master, one can have some difficulty in, 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 in proper understanding of, of all this. But, but this this story here is described in, 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 in a way that uh, can be easily understood by, by everybody. But if one wants to, to get a 
the story written by, by Valmiki, so just get the copy of Ramayana, read it, and, uh, and then some enlightenment, very important enlightenment about those things will come. So, in a sense, there is no difference between Krishna and Rama. There is some difference in appearance and in, in, in behalf, in feelings. So, God, appearances have different gradations. So, Ayodhya, the capital city of the Ram, is an example of God who is worshipped in, in a feeling of, of Aishvarya, meaning majesty. So, you consider him being almighty, little bit distant, the king sitting on the throne with his wife, maybe with his brothers, nearby, and with a kneeling Hanuman at his feet. But we are also Krishna. Who is worshipped in the mood of Madhurya, meaning sweetness. There, there is no this feeling of, of majesty. To such a great that Krishna's associates playing with him, jumping on his shoulders, making jokes. This is impossible to do with Ram, but this is possible to do with Krishna. Therefore, we prefer this connection, this relationship with God, who can be easily approached, where the only rule of conduct is pure love. So, we are meditating through our chanting of the Holy Name on, on our Japa Mala, on our beats. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Again and again, thousands of times a day. And at the same time, living a decent life, we are trying to satisfy the Lord. Because it is our constitutional position to serve God with love. This is our only business. Who does it lives a very comfortable and happy life. Who are not able to do it must struggle with everyday life, with suffering. Because such a person is on the material platform. Material platform means to do things for our own pleasure. Spiritual life means to do things, doesn't matter what we do, for Krishna's pleasure. So, therefore it's important to learn about who is Krishna, what he does every day, how he lives. In this way we will be able to know what can please him? And then it's just to follow. So in this way, the process of bhakti yoga, loving relationship with a God is very easy. It's not that complicated. But it's getting very complicated 
if this practice goes against our desires. Because if we go the way of our desires, then it can be very hard to serve the Lord. Because then we want to be served. We are getting jealous of Krishna. We are getting jealous of God. So, naturally, we will revolt against this serving to him. And we will choose to live in the material world, which means a life of an animal, as we could see through the story of Ram in the earlier passages of the story. So we could see what the animal life means. So animal life means to do things for our own pleasure. The godly life means to do things for Krishna's pleasure. It will take some time, depending on our karma, meaning the result of our earlier actions in earlier existences. It will depend on our shukriti, meaning the good results of our acts in, in former life or even in this life. So, but if you are sincere, surely will come to, to a happy ending, meaning we will return back to our home, which means we will return to the consciousness of serving God with love and, and affection, which as I said to to you before is the only religion. Is we have only one God and we have only one religion. The name of this religion is love of God. And no one can claim the owner of this. No Christians, no Muslims, no Hindu can claim that only in their tradition you can find this phenomenon because love of God is not dependent on the, these things. You can find it everywhere. Therefore, we have saints all in all times and in different places on the earth. And as the Vedic story, history tells us, even, even on the other planets and in the other universes. Thank you very much.